The Apartment Gurus podcast is brought to you by Greenlight Equity Group, an apartment acquisitions and holdings firm co-founded by Carl York and Tate Seamer, host of this show. We offer you the opportunity to be an owner of cash-flowing, wealth-growing apartments without the headaches of being a landlord. These assets are recession-resistant, risk-mitigated, offer significant tax advantages, and are a great alternative to the stock market. Ready to check it out? Go to www.investwithgreenlight.com today to book a personal consultation with Carl or Tate. Again, that's investwithgreenlight.com. We look forward to meeting you. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome everybody back. Another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast coming at you right now and i'm excited about today's show i'm coming at you from uh what is now snowy utah we've got about two feet of snow in the mountains over the last few days and uh the skier in me is delighting in that it is a little early for snow uh here but we'll take it and uh, we're very happy um joining me today on the show is a, a guru uh, for sure. And uh, her name's Ashley Wilson. And I'm super excited to have Ashley on the show. Ashley is a, uh, she's the co-founder of Bar Down Investments uh, and also the co-host of the Passive Investing Show. should check that out. Um, she's also the best-selling author of The Only Woman in the Room, that's, I, I can't wait to hear a little more about that, Ashley. Um, and also knowledge and inspiration from 20 women real estate investors, super inspiring. And she's also a uh, series host on the Bigger Pockets uh, show uh, platform. Um, she started investing in 2009 and has been involved in over $100 million in transactions within both single family and multifamily real estate across 1,500 units. When Ashley is not working on her business, she enjoys spending time with her family, including her husband and two daughters. Um, additionally, Ashley enjoys competing with her horses. That's exciting. Um, I know somebody that is will love to talk to you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that maybe off the air uh, about your horses and your investing and your so particularly your emphasis on uh, women investors. I think I think that's uh, really needed in our space and and uh, to be celebrated for sure. So um, one of Ashley's notable goals is to provide 100 million or sorry, 1 million in returns this year to uh, their investors. So Ashley, welcome to the show. I'm really grateful for uh, you coming on and look forward to this discussion. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. Um, so Ashley, if you would just um, kind of give us a little backstory to you and your, you know, your, your path to where you are today. You've, you've done some amazing things in the real estate space um, and, and done a lot of transactions, uh, a lot of volume. You know, how, how did you get to, you know, wandering around in, in diapers and playing in a crib to, to uh, becoming such a maven in the real estate space? You don't have to start at, 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 at uh, diapers. Uh, I can fast forward. Can fast forward. <laughs> yes. Um, so actually I was working in pharmaceuticals. I was working in clinical research and development and I worked on, um, uh, the Ambien team originally. So I worked for Santa Fe Aventis then I worked for Wyeth, which was acquired by Pfizer. And then I worked for GlaxoSmithKline in the vaccine division. And I left that career um, as the director of global project management for vaccine development within clinical trials. And I 
obviously was doing very well at a very young age and I was fast tracked and I had this vision that I either needed to basically invent something to become a CEO, or I needed to work my way up to become a CEO. And I chose the latter. So I was working very hard and I was making pretty good money at a really young age. And, um, I started dating my now husband and he introduced me to podcasts and we started listening to bigger pockets podcasts. And then that turned into us buying our first rental property and then short-term rentals and long-term rentals. And then I started a house flipping business with my father um, in 2014. And then in 2018, I transitioned into commercial real estate. Hmm. How did you, uh, what was your inspiration for making the transition? I think I'm naturally an entrepreneur. I've always been in, in a sense, um, you know, leader of all of my sport teams, I was in group projects, the one to take lead on all the projects. I always wanted to take control of everything. And, um, I, when I left pharma, even though we were doing really well in real estate, I didn't see real estate as the vehicle on which I would become an entrepreneur. In fact, I started three other companies prior to realizing real estate was, perfectly fitted for by mindset. Mm. Um, so, uh, it took me a little while, um, to figure that out. Uh, but I am very grateful for the journey because every aspect of the journey has really been transferable to real estate and helped me be successful today. Yeah. 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 With, with entrepreneurship, it seems like really, any and all professional experience, uh, lends to being a better entrepreneur, uh, whether that's corporate experience, uh, you know, in your case, really high level pharmaceutical, uh, a corporate experience. And, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that you were able to transfer a lot of your, your skills and, and interpersonal skills and, and professional skills to your, uh, investing career. Um, are, are there any specifics that you identify as, as, uh, you know, things that you learned in your former life, so to speak, that, uh, have helped you out in real estate? The number one thing that helped me, um, uh, you know, that I learned in my previous career that has helped me in real estate is managing from afar. Mm. So when I started in pharmaceuticals, I worked in the U S division, but everyone that I managed and communicated with was not co-located in my office. Uh -huh. So I had to deal with varying time zones and I didn't at that time have to necessarily deal with different cultures, but I definitely had to deal with different personalities and being able to communicate effectively, um, not face to face. Mm -hmm. And then after I left, um, Santa Fe and Wyeth, I went to GlaxoSmithKline where I went on the global side. And when I worked globally, now all of a sudden I'm dealing with different cultures coupled with working from afar, coupled with the fact that English isn't, um, but I would, I would guess 95% of the people that I worked with English wasn't their first language. So there are a lot of different communication styles that I learned and how to effectively communicate and manage a project to be successful, um, had its inherent challenges. And today I think it is so easy to manage from afar. People are really shocked at how well I can manage from afar, but my entire career, um, even pre real estate has been managing from afar. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that, um, really can become a wonderful aspect of this path, this, uh, this entrepreneurial career path. I'm actually headed on Saturday. Uh, we're recording this at the end of October in 2022. And, I'm ha I'm headed to uh, Mexico for a month, the month of November, um, and we'll be wor working remotely and managing from afar, like you say, um, and I'm really excited about it. It's my first stab at that. Um, I've realized that everything I do, for the most part, can be done remotely. 
except for market visits. So uh, when we, you know, when we go check on our properties and look for other properties. So um, my friend Derek Clifford and his wife Sophie, they they uh, live Airbnb to Airbnb month to month uh, and don't have a home, but they're killing it in the commercial real estate space and and uh, are living a very exciting life. So yeah, that's super exciting. Ashley, j just curious, where are you located? I'm located right outside of, outside of Philadelphia. Gotcha, gotcha. In okay, the suburbs. And um, where are the majority of the properties that you've uh, that you've acquired and and you know sold and that sort of thing? Uh, commercial properties are in Texas. Yep. Residential. Um, when I did residential, it was all in Pennsylvania. But I used to live in Europe and Russia when I did residential. Mm. Okay. So you were doing the single family residential stuff from afar. That seems like mm -hmm. it would be pretty challenging uh, to me. It would take some special skills. Um, it really was pretty easy. Um, yeah. Like you said, you can do everything from afar. You just have to leverage technology and communication. Um, so... I literally found the property, analyzed the property, did a walkthrough either with my partner, who is my father, and he served his boots on the ground. And he, you know, he is a general contractor, so he has tremendous amount of experience and well versed with historic homes and full gut rehabs, um, or the realtor. Um, and then I would schedule the contractors. I would. Uh, do all the design. I would order all the materials. Um, everything really can be done if you have the right systems in place um, from afar. And then, you know, my dad used to say that he did adult daycare. He made sure that mm. people showed up. Right. But um, you can even have uh, different systems in place where you're you know, checking in on your contractors and you can set up cameras in the house and you can really have eyes on your project at all time without physically being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like you had a, a really key team member there too. That was, uh, that was a, a real crucial part of your, your, uh, mm -hmm. operations and your dad of all people. Mm -hmm. That's pretty exciting. Is he still involved in what you're up to? He has now partnered with someone else um, because I've transitioned to commercial. Okay. He really wanted to stay within residential. He loves flipping houses. So um, we might do a project here and there together, but um, my passion really is in commercial real estate these days. So, um, you know, we, we loved working together, but in terms of what we were working on, we just had a difference of, what we are passionate about. Sure, sure. And there can be challenges in working with with close friends and family as well. Um, and some people like to just stay, you know, clear of that. And other people have done, you know, have their 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 spouse as their partner, or uh, you know, and, and different strokes for different folks as far as that goes. And there's a lot of a lot of different ways to skin the cat. So, um, so. Talk to me a little bit about Bar Down. First, first of all, what does the name mean? Where did where did the name originate? So um, my husband was a professional athlete and I was a division one athlete. And we really wanted to incorporate sports into our company name. Uh, we co-founded it together. Mm -hmm. And um uh, bar down is a shot in hockey. It's also in soccer where you hit the top of the crossbar and it goes in the net. It's one of the most difficult shots to take, but it's one of the most beautiful shots to take. And, um, it's considered the best shot to take. So what we wanted to exemplify in our name is that by working with us and investing with us, it provides you the best shot, um, because we are, um, focused on the details and precision um, to get you um, a successful return on your investment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I, I, I'm a huge soccer fan and have season tickets to our pro team here in Salt Lake, and uh, and have never heard that term before. But I, I know I know the shot, and I, I can visualize it. So 
Um, so I, I love that. I, I love how you guys came up with that together. Uh, what role does your husband play these days and what you're up to? He is, um, he underwrite, he's still doing underwriting. Um, he will eventually serve as an advisor in the company. Um, so about a year and a half ago, um, we, my husband and I had a conversation and we decided that he did not want to be full-time in the business anymore. We started working with Jay Scott a few years prior um, in a more limited capacity, but Jay and I, uh, we get along very, very well. We have complementary skills um, and our ethics and morals align 100%. So I asked Jay if he would be interested in coming on as a partner and Jay and I have partnered since then. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really, um, uh, blessed to have Jay as a partner. Um, and I'm really grateful, you know, that we still, my husband still supports us with the underwriting because even though he's a professional hockey player, he was a physics undergrad and he was actually supposed to go to school for engineering. Mm. Um, after, after his physics degree, um, but he got drafted. So, uh, he, his career took a little bit of a turn. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like it. Yeah. So that's super exciting. So talk about, uh, how you and your current partner work together. What roles do you play there? So because I kind of had to learn from, you know, literally the bottom, like the ground floor, so to speak, I had, I figured out every single aspect of the business. So mm -hmm. I know how to do underwriting, even though I am not good at underwriting, I'm good at the operational side of underwriting, but the technical side of underwriting, my husband is very precise. Mm -hmm. And when you are an underwriter, you cannot make a single error. Um, so he's very detail oriented and he is very objective. I'm more towing the line between objective and subjective. I'm not all the way subjective, but I'm not, um, all the way objective either. So I find that underwriters tend to be someone who is very objective, very, very objective and very, uh, detail oriented. So, yeah. um, even though I do know that role, that's not my favorite. Um, so I've, uh, done sourcing. I still do sourcing today. Um, I help with the underwriting from an ops perspective. I run asset. Well, historically I run asset and construction management, but we have now brought on uh, teammates to help us execute and historically also raise capital. I got the deal to close. I mean, literally I was doing everything except for the granular level underwriting. Um, but as we've grown our team out today, the way the organization works is Jay handles a lot of our um, work with the lawyers um, with respect to PPM creation and entity structuring uh, along with capital stack. So he is involved primarily in the equity side, unless it's a PE, private equity, a single check writer, and then it's me. Um, yeah. just because typically they want to speak with someone who's more operationally focused and I'm very operationally focused and kind of understand things soup to nuts. Yeah. So, um, that's the only caveat to that, but he does, uh, you know, all of our investor relations and, um, uh, he also to, um, him and my husband, they look and analyze market cycles and market selection. And uh, we do in-depth reviews on the markets we're in and the markets we're going to. Um, so he supports all of that. And then I'm definitely a visionary. Mm -hmm. So in terms of where I want the business to go. Um, Jay and I work hand in hand, um, trying to figure that out and build that out uh, together. So we really kind of, we see things from different perspectives, I guess, but we, um, between the two of us, it's like we see the whole picture. So mm. that's been really great to work with someone who's so complimentary of the skill sets that you have. Yeah. 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 And, you know, in a good entrepreneurial partnership, you have a visionary and you have a tactician. 
um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to simplify things greatly. Uh, in, in my company, Greenlight, uh, Carl is, is the tactician very much so is, you know, handles, like you said, attorneys, uh, entity structure, um, yeah, paying the bills, right? This, he's the CFO. Um, he's uh, all, on all the asset management meetings. And, uh, and then I'm really leading from the front with our broker relations and investor relations. And, and uh, you know, you, you mentioned institutional equity that that's something that I uh, work on as well in in our company. So, uh, so yeah, it sounds like a very uh, complimentary relationship the two of you have. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so what are you guys up to now? Like, are, do you have deals in the pipe? Yeah, this is a, we're again, end of October, 2022. We're in a really mm -hmm. interesting time in the multifamily space, uh, real estate space in general, interest rates have spiked. Um, and in a lot of cases, sellers expectations have not, uh, adjusted. Um, so it's tricky right now. Um, how are you guys navigating and, and, uh, what are you focusing on? Um, so that's a great question. I mean, I'm a firm believer that it's always a good time to buy. It just depends on what you're paying. Yeah, totally. <laughs> right. And, right. um, how you, how you're underwriting. Um, so, um, you could arguably say it's all perspective, right? So, when is it, how do you define a good time to buy? Do you define a good time to buy when uh, you have the least amount of competition or do you define the right time to buy based off of uh, the lowest price? Because they're not always one in the same. Sure. Um, and I would arguably say that at least in my tenure in multifamily, this is the least amount of competition I've ever seen. Um, I have brokers literally calling me nonstop um, and I am offering on deals left and right, right now. Um, and most people I talk to are sitting on the sidelines, which is fantastic because the more people that are sitting on the sidelines, the more I'm going to find that needle in the haystack, um, that only gets one offer and has no other choice, but to sell. So, um, we are very conservative when we underwrite. So, you know, people might be listening to this and saying, oh my gosh, Ashley's crazy right now to be offering with all the volatility in the market. Um, but I think if you, I mean, obviously I don't have a crystal ball, but if you put conservative measures in place, if you underwrite um, enough cushion with respect to cap rate expansion and interest rates and um, your reserves, you can put yourself in a very opportunistic situation in which you can, um, you know, pick up hopefully some good deals um, with the least amount of competition. We have a hard time buying properties in highly competitive markets because we are very conservative. We're typically not, you know, in best and final during a frothy market. So Q1 and Q2 of this year, um, we weren't in any best and finals, um, rightfully so, because the, you know, the brokers frothy. couldn't even get OMs out. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. very frothy and brokers didn't even have time to get OMs out. Right. They were yeah. literally just turning and burning. You know, yeah. they, they weren't even going through a whole competitive bid process. Um, and frankly, you know, that was our least competitive time. Every single time that we're putting an offer, I mean, we're putting in offers 20, 30% below easily on what the whisper is. And we're having conversations like yeah. it's crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think there are some opportunities and also, you know, once again, it comes to perspective, like some people would say, well, why would you be buying now with the interest rates? So uncertain and, um, cap rates, like how are you underwriting cap rates on your exit? Um, well, that's part of what, what we're responsible for doing, but what we're also responsible for doing is the price we pay per door. And, you know, I just posted 
on LinkedIn about this yesterday that the historic way to evaluate properties was off the NOI approach, but there's two other ways that you can evaluate multifamily properties. One is comparable sales approach, and the second one is replacement value. Yeah. And I, you know, being someone who had a contractor as a father, I am very well versed in construction and I know the cost uh, for replacement value. And frankly, you can't build these properties for what they're asking for per door today. That's right. So, you know, if you want to shift shift your perspective and flip the script, so to speak, you know, you still have to make money. And like, I'm not trying to discount that, yeah. but at the same time, if you can purchase a property for less than what the replacement value is, there's a trickle down effect when it comes to development because the developers won't be able to build. I mean, you know, there's a lot of permits um, towards uh, the beginning of this year that were issued and in the middle of this year, but we're seeing that cool down too by market. And I think it's because even though, you know, we've had uh, materials come down, they haven't come down enough. And the debt market is so unstable that developers, they're going in on a bridge on a construction loan, and they don't know what to underwrite on a refi into uh, perm debt. And the risk profile is too high for them. So then on the other side, you have less development going on. So you have less supply. Right. Um, so then that inevitably will push up the value. It'll push it back up. So I just, I, I think there's more to this story than just looking at where we're at today. You have to look at basic economics. You have to look at where we've come from. History has a tendency to repeat itself. So looking at historic trends in um, compression, uh, cap rate expansion and uh, interest rate um, expansion and how, how they coincide and what the lag effect is. I mean, there's just so many factors that come into play um, that I don't think it's worth being scared over. It's just kind of understanding all these factors and taking your best guess while being conservative on which which factor you think is going to outweigh and you pick the most conservative one. You go through all the scenarios, you pick the most conservative one and you underwrite to that. Yeah, very smart. Um, with, do you guys have stuff under contract right now or are you, are you stuff in the pipe or where are you with that? Um, I mean, we have offers out right now, yeah. but we don't have anything under contract. We have offers every week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're offering almost one deal a day right now. Wow. Okay. And you, you mentioned you're not in, a, you know, hyper competitive markets. Uh, what market, can you give us an example of a market that you're in or that you, that you're making offers in? Uh, we are in a hyper competitive market. I just meant that we can't compete in the in we're in Houston right now. That's okay. the rest of our yep. we sold off uh, properties last year, but our um, rest of our portfolio is in Houston right now, okay. and it is a highly competitive market. Sure but um, I've spent a, a long time building relationships and. Um, you know, people know I can close and people know that I'm very knowledgeable about multifamily. So they know, you know, that when I come in with an offer, I'm not going to retrade because I know construction. So the, the likelihood to close without issues is very low. Mm -hmm. Um, so that has boded very well, um, for me in terms of getting the calls that I'm getting today. Yeah. Yeah. Super exciting. Where you, where are you guys headed from here, Ashley? What's what's on the horizon for you all? We're a firm believer that whatever we are doing personally, 
Um, we, we want to, you know, kind of practice what we preach or, or preach what we practice kind of thing. So in the sense that we are highly diversified, we aren't solely a multifamily. We, you know, we get calls constantly from people who say, you know, I have a million dollars to invest and I only want to invest it with you. And, um, what deal do you have that I can put you know, a million in. And then we say to them, you know, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes on why that's a bad idea. Mm. Um, you need to be diversified across markets, across operators, across assets. Um, you cannot just invest solely with one individual. That is not a smart decision to do. Mm. Um, and while that has worked in terms of people, you know, realize that we're looking out for them and and we're educating them on the on the benefits of being highly diversified um we're noticing that a lot of people come back to us and say okay well then what are you guys investing in and um you know what are uh, uh, some alternative investments that um you know you th- you currently are investing in that you think you know provide that um just wealth building protection and capital preservation protection. So we have uh, explored that um, internally and um, we will be opening up a diversified fund shortly um, Mm, to offer to our investors and um, go through a very heavy, you know, scrutinization process of, operators because we are heavy in operations. I think that's the number one reason people invest with us is because we are known uh, for how we operate. So to us, operations are the most important aspect of an investment. Um, so if we you know, find these opportunities that we're willing to invest in, why not um, provide those opportunities for other people as well if they want, if they choose to um uh, uh, want to be diversified. Will this include stuff outside of real estate as well? Not on the first fund, but on future funds. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, do you have any notable goals as far as, uh, you know, the future growth? Uh, 2030, we want to have a billion assets under management. Um, so that is our goal, uh, for 2030 this year, we want to return a million, uh, to our investors. And then we have goals every single year based off of returns to investors. So we worked backwards from that to get Mm -hmm. to the, um, 2030, uh, goal of a billion assets under management. So that's really how we're, we're going about it. Yeah. That's an awesome goal. Awesome goal. Very cool, Ashley. Well, um, this, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for everything you shared. You, you've got a great story, very inspiring. Talk to us a little bit about the, the books that you've written. Um, you know, d- describe those a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so, so far I've only published one book. I'm actually, no one knows this, but I'm actually in the process of writing a second book. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the book that I wrote, it just happens to be next to me. The, this wasn't planned by the way. I just, yeah. <laughs> um, I have to, I have to mail, um, a, a copy out. Someone won a book. So it's called cool. the only woman in the room, knowledge and inspiration from 20 women, real estate investors. Yeah. I attended a conference, um, uh, that Dave Van Horn put on in 2000, I think it was 2018 or 2019. And, um, and in he, at this conference, the co-founders of the real estate investor community were there and asked all women in attendance to have lunch together. Mm. There were 450 attendees at the conference and only 16 women at these two tables. So I was sitting at the table. Now keep in mind, I went to an all boys school in high school that went co-ed my sophomore year, my senior year of college. I lived with 14 other boys in a house Mm -hmm. and I had never had any sort of epiphany that like, wow, I'm always in situations where I'm the only woman in the room. It wasn't until that conference did it really hit me that, 
wow, there are not a lot of women in this industry. Yeah. So on the ride home, I told my husband, I wanted to write a book called the only woman in the room and talk about women in real estate. I didn't know the form that it would take, but over the next year, I, unbeknownst to the now authors, I secretly interviewed women and asked them to tell me their story. And, you know, I really just wanted to get to know all different women in real estate. And then I hand selected 19 women to be co-authors of the book. Um, and then we published it uh, two years ago this September. Mm. So um really proud of the book because it is a combination of both inspirational stories, but a lot of actionable tips in all different asset classes. Um, I tend to find more men purchase the book than women. I think that's in large part because I find whether right or wrong that women tend to be more transparent about sharing the secret sauce behind their success. Mm -hmm. So a lot of men have come to me and said, I literally just read this one chapter and the next day I was able to execute on X, Y, Z. Um, mm -hmm. Or they read the book and then they were like, we're, I gave it to every single woman in my family as Christmas gifts. That was a comment that I got from a couple men, uh, not last Christmas, the Christmas before. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's surprising. I did not think it would be an evergreen book. I thought it would be a book that had some notoriety at the launch, but it would fizzle out. And I feel like it has more momentum today than it's ever had. Um, people are constantly uh, talking about the book. And I know off of sales because of my royalties from it, that um, it hasn't slowed down. So um, I'm just happy that um, you know I've seen an influx of women in this space and um, women outlive men six to eight years. And on average, it costs anywhere from 286,000 to 316,000 cost of living over that time. Mm -hmm. That burden is not placed on other women. It's placed on family members. So it can be men or women. So having vehicles in which women can, um, build financial freedom, um, it's not, the book is not, uh, you know, at the detriment of men. In fact, there's only, I think, two sentences in the entire book that even reference being the only woman in the room, so to speak. Everything else is just about, you know, someone's journey or, you know, tactical tips on how to execute a certain asset class. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for women who pick up the book and read it, they can see themselves in that situation, whether it's, you know, they're very young and in this space, very old, divorced, abused, uh, you know, just don't have the confidence because they don't know construction. Um, you know, there are a lot of different chapters. And my goal was that anyone who picked up the book, whether it be a woman or a man, could relate to at least one author. So an entire chapter someone can relate to. And I definitely think that was achieved. Yeah, yeah. Super exciting. Good for you, Ashley. Well, Ashley, this has been Thank great. You. <laughs> You're welcome. I appreciate, pre really appreciate you being on the show. What is the best way for listeners to reach out to you and, and learn more about in, investing opportunities and, and whatnot? You can go to our website, which is bardowninvestments.com. If you are a passive investor, if you're an active investor and you want to learn from me and my partner, Jay Scott, you can go to apartmentaddicts.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me on Instagram at Bad Ash Investor. Bad Ash Investor. Love it. Mm -hmm. Good job. That's awesome. All Thank right. You. Well, uh, Ashley, really appreciate you being on the show um, and wish you all, wish you all the best. You guys are uh, up to some big, big things. And and I, I like the way that you, you're doing it. Conservative underwriting, uh, conservative purchasing and and uh, conservative letter of intent writing. So. Um, so, yeah, great job. And and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be watching you and, and uh, cheering for you from, from over here at Greenlight in Utah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Listen, 
Listeners, thank you so much for uh, listening to the end of another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast. Really appreciate you guys. If you feel led, uh, we love ratings and reviews. So, um, you know, feel free to leave a rating and review on your your platform that you're listening on uh, today. So with that, uh, everybody have go have a great day and everything that you're up to. And we'll see you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. This has been the Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of the Apartment Gurus.